Hi, I'm Sandhya Shekhar, and uh, welcome to Nothing is Rocket Science, um, a podcast where we discuss the science behind everything. Um, Indians all over the world have been rejoicing for the last two or three weeks, especially after the phenomenal win in the second and third test match against England. So I thought, why not use this opportunity to understand the science behind the game of cricket? So we have with us today, Mr. Rishi Roy, who is a commentator and the sub-editor at Craig Bus. Rishi studied to be a software engineer, but took the path uh, to becoming a commentator and sub-editor at Craig Bus as he's passionate about the game. In addition to this, he is a cricket writer and a blogger and uses these platforms to decode and demystify the game of cricket. You can read his articles ranging from technical pieces on swing and seam uh, bowling to story about uh, story pieces such as when the world first laid eyes on Sachin Tendulkar uh, or the evolution of Virat Kohli on his column, The Name of the Game, on uh, the Crick Buzz website, the links to which will be posted in the description. Um, so welcome to the podcast, Rishi. It's great to have you uh, on board with us today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, before we start off with this, um, I know I just mentioned that, you know, uh, like having studied engineering, you took up this, but what was the, like, what, why, why, what made you take, make this decision to take up, uh, you know, not, 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 not take up the software uh, engineering field, but uh, choose the game of cricket? Um, I mean, there, there's, it's not exactly a fairy tale. It's, it's more of a sort of, I, I did I did work in tech for a while. I did work in tech for about um, nine to ten months. Okay. And then that spanned across two startups, which had a lot of financial problems. And eventually, I got a call from from Crickbuzz, which was um, it was pretty timely, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. And Crickbuzz is somewhere I had applied like during college, just as you know, let's see where this goes. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, eventually I, I joined in 2017 and um, yeah, it, it's something I never expected to be working in a field, um, you know, which I was so passionate about. And yeah, I've been working there for the best part of four years now. All right. Um, uh, and uh, besides writing about cricket and, uh, you know, and these wonderful articles, uh, what are your other roles um, in Craig Buzz? Like, do you get to go on field or is it like, you know, do you sit indoors and um, watch it on a big screen and then make the commentary? Um, yeah, so our uh, primary role is commentary, uh, watching it on the big screen and um, just putting it out there for our users as, as quickly as possible and as mm -hmm. uh, concisely as possible. Uh, yeah, we do get the chance to travel at times, um, particularly for the IPL um and okay. other events uh we get to interview a lot of uh, players uh we get to interview uh coaches and i mean pretty much anything that we need to write about um and yeah that, that's a lot of fun that's some great exposure for us as well um and yeah it's, it's been a it's been a great journey thus far in Christmas. that's great and uh, how has you know uh, the pandemic affected um, your job or like how is it how is it to report sports uh, I mean it's great that um, you know the sports is slowly picking up in different parts of the world uh, I mean because everything was uh, stopped because of social distancing and things like that but now with um, restrictions and a lot of um, um, you know uh, things in place uh, I'm glad that with limited audience uh, we are able to open the stadiums to uh, to the to the public or like you know it it started off where they just started playing cricket with no spectators uh, but as a commentator uh, how was uh, how uh, how was your experience uh, you know with with cricket during this pandemic um, right so during the lockdown the there was absolutely no cricket played for the best part of maybe five months, I think. Right. And I think we, right. we, resumed, we resumed in July last year. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was, it was a little strange. We hadn't, particularly as commentators, we hadn't worked from home uh, before because um, it was just a very 
team oriented job this entire thing you know there the, there's generally a scorer a commentator there's someone handling social media and there's mm-hmm. about five or six people working on the same game from the same um studio so um yeah it was a little, little strange and um also in terms of reporting we uh, i mean the press hasn't been allowed um into the ground like not not the i mean some 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 uh, reporters have been but it's been very selective um mm-hmm. so yeah maybe if if about 20 people were allowed before now it's about 7 or 8 um so it's it's been a little difficult for us to uh, report from the ground um so yeah it's it's been a it's been a strange year um yeah. in 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 this um domain for sure right um so yeah let's i think let's let's get on to the questions because we have a lot of interesting topics that uh, that we have you to talk about to start with um let's start with the cricket ball the section so that's the anatomy and physiology of the cricket ball um as you know everybody is aware that there are we have a white ball we have uh, the red ball that we use uh, for um you know the one days and then now we just started the pink ball um so can you tell us the difference between these uh you know the different types of cricket balls and uh, like and also what is an sg what is duke what is a kokopara ball and how are they different from each other and why do we need to have so many um varieties right so um the, the colors have just been made up for um visibility um particularly because uh let, let's start with the with the red ball the red ball um it's the most traditional kind of cricket ball um it's made from cow leather and uh, so the 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 core of the ball is made out of cork mm-hmm. and then there are um five about five layers of um uh, again cork and twine and then there's there's a a, le- a layer of leather which um which is internally stitched internally cross stitched mm-hmm. and then um that's that's what we call the internal seam and then it's externally stitched as well with the external seam which we can see like that's the mm-hmm. protrusion on the ball and then it's oh, the wh- the white threading right that, that the white threading the, yeah right. that's right so and then it's you know varnished and polished and everything um finished and branded so that's that's not really the the important part in term in terms of um the the functionality now uh the red ball um i mean the manufacturing process on the inside is pretty much the same but uh, the red ball is played uh, is is used in test matches right so it's just uh designed to be uh you know visible amidst all the white clothing and the white side screen as well um so that it's visible to the batsman uh, it's like in terms of contrast um similarly uh, you may have noticed that the white the, the white ball that's used in one day cricket um there tends to be a black side screen in front of the batsman right so right. Um, that's again again for contrast as well so uh just in, in terms of um like how long the ball needs to last and uh the difference between the 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 different colors of ball this i mean the color does not exactly make uh, make much of a difference because it's just the dye that's changing the color it's still the same material mm-hmm. but um the thing is on the on the white ball there is a bit of an acrylic coating um which essentially uh prevents one of the sides from getting scuffed up it's it's much harder to create a contrast uh between the two sides and eventually that that will just mean it'll swing for the first few overs um as long as the ball is new and after that the seam is just going to flatten out and um so that brings me to the three different brands of ball which is kookaburra mm-hmm. the duke and the and the sg so the major difference between between the three is um the kind of stitching and uh, yeah the kind of stitching involved in the three because mm-hmm. kookaburra is the is one of the most widely used brands of cricket ball in the world um mm-hmm. so um there's there's only one layer of stitching that goes across the ball 
and that okay. that makes it that makes it a little dur uh, like less durable right and the rest of okay. the rest of the stitching is just machine stitching and it's purely for cosmetic purposes um the problem with that is that the seam is very flat and it it won't respond for too long and it just um tears apart uh, eventually within like maybe 20 25 overs on on like a hard australian surface mm -hmm. um similarly uh, like an sg or a duke ball which has which takes a lot like a few more man hours to construct to uh produce than than a kookaburra ball um those balls i mean they're a lot more they last a lot longer they last for 50 or 60 overs i mean we've, we've never exactly experimented with an sg ball in the uk for example but it should last just as long as a duke ball it's just that it's been we've we've played on you know more abrasive subcontinental pitches which is why it, it does wear out a little more quickly mm -hmm. um so yeah that's and and because of the six layers of stitching that goes through each SG and Duke's ball, I think it's a, it's a lot. They're both a lot more durable than the than the Kookaburra ball. Yeah. Mm. And uh, do we like you know? I I know. I think we use SG in India, right? When they play uh, test matches or cricket test in matches. India. Um, so is it uh, restricted to a particular country, or uh, are there instances where we've played with the Kookaburra ball in India, or we? do we always stick with uh, the SGE? Um, so that, that's, a, that's a purely commercial thing. It's, it, it hasn't been very okay. well documented in the past, but there were a few other okay. companies. Um, for example, um, Grays. Grays used to manufacture a particular mm -hmm. kind of ball. Uh, there's a company called Readers. They, they manufactured a few uh, cricket balls. So, so in, uh, there, has, there have been test matches played with the Readers ball in India, for instance. Um, and as far as I, uh, understand it, um, they had, they had, they had like fully machine stitched balls as well. And with far better leather quality, which is, which came from like, um, basically Scottish leather, which is a lot more, um, it, it was of a better quality than, than Indian leather, for example. Um, okay. so yeah, so yeah, they have, they have played with uh, other brands of ball. It's, it's purely commercial, you see, because, um, okay. the only, the only countries, um, that do play with the Duke ball, um, are the West Indies and England, England. Mm -hmm. um, in, in test cricket and ODIs, I mean, Kookaburra just has a, has a, a monopoly and mm. yeah, they use the SG ball only in India and, um, it, there's, there's been a lot of talk in terms of you know, um, the Dukes, the Dukes factory, for example, they produce about 300 balls a day and it, they're going to have to do a lot more than that um, to supply to countries like uh, India and Australia and, and mm -hmm. um, countries like that, right? So, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and yeah, so can you uh, tell us the dif uh, different deliveries that we have? Like, you know, what, what, what is a fastball? Uh, what's a conventional swing, a reverse swing? a seam and a short ball and um, and yeah we're going to talk in detail about uh, swing and seam but if you can just touch upon the other types of deliveries right so so the seam and swing are um oddly enough two of the most confused um right. topics in in cricket um so swing happens um as a result of Either, either some sort of turbulence or um, the ball reacting to the air, basically. So it, it, it results in the ball moving in the air. Um, seam happens, seam movement happens as a result of the cricket ball not being a perfect sphere, right? There is mm, the, yeah. So um, the seam itself is a, is a pretty large protrusion on, on the cricket ball. And when the ball bounces on the seam, it's not going to just bounce back up normally, uh, like like a tennis ball. There is going mm -hmm. to be a certain certain degree of movement. And uh, the most interesting thing about that is that it it cannot be predicted by anyone. It's I mean, even if you're mm -hmm. the best batsman in the world, you've got to pick it off the pitch. You can't pick it off the hand or anything. Even the bowler won't know which way or how much it's going to move. So you've mm -hmm. got to have prime reaction. So 
um, yeah, seam is definitely a lot more dangerous than swing um, in, in that it cannot be technically predicted. cannot be de decoded, predicted, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sorry, was there another question? I, uh, yeah, um, just the, the regular fastball, um, reverse swing and short ball. Right, so um, just, yeah, basic definitions. The short ball is, is a ball that um, generally is pitched on the bowler side of the pitch um, and is meant to intimidate the batsman. It's supposed to be at the batsman's, either at the batsman's rib cage or, or his head, um, just so that he, he's a little more, um, he takes a fraction of a second more to come onto the front foot on the next ball. It's just meant to play on the batsman's psyche. Um, <clears throat> faster bowlers, they, they tend to work just with pace. There, there are very few express pacers out there. Um, possibly Shane Bond, Shoy Bakhtar, Brett Lee, uh, who could clock it up to 150 easily and mm -hmm. then some maybe. They, some, of, some, some bowlers have touched even 160, which is just ridiculous. It's, it's, it's a little... Um, yeah, that's just certainly very uncommon. I mean, it's, it's often been said that maybe 160, 61, which is about 100 miles per hour, that may be the, the end, that, that, may be, that may be a human threshold for um, yeah. pace. So yeah, that's just ridiculous. It's, it's really difficult to see the ball um, at that pace. And, um, and yeah, of course, there's, there's the Yorker, uh, which is... Yeah the king of all deliveries, even, even right now, it's so relevant with, uh, with the T20 um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to bowl a Yorker. It's just, it's just gold. We, uh, you know, teams in the IPL and um, like T20 leagues all around the world are looking for bowlers who can bowl a really good Yorker and they're going for millions. So yeah, it's, it's certainly one of the most valued assets in the game. Right. Uh, now coming to the you know the topic of discussion. So if you can take us through the science of uh, the swing and uh, and then we'll move on to uh, seam. Uh, we do have a few questions with uh, swing, but if you can just take us through the science and the different aspects of uh, swinging. Okay, so um, let's start with just what just let's just start with the definitions, right? So mm -hmm. um, okay, I'll just share the screen. Right. Can you see this? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just started. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to have to say just ignore the text for a while. And um, mm -hmm. so we are imagining, yeah, just imagine the ball going from the bottom of the screen towards the top of the screen, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. that's how the ball would be delivered. And that's, that's looking at it from a bird's eye view. That's looking at it from okay. the top. So imagine there's like a chopper at the top of the stadium and that's how it sees the ball, right? So this is conventional outswing. So the definition would be um, with the new ball, just imagine new ball and whichever, whatever the direction of the seam is. So in this case, the seam is pointing towards the slips, right? For, mm -hmm. for a right hand, for a right hander. Um, so if that's the direction of the of the seam, then the ball is supposed to swing with the direction of the seam, like towards the direction of the seam. And that's what conventional swing is. Similarly, if the seam was pointing inwards, then the, the ball would swing into the batsman and towards the direction of leg slip, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so that's the, that's the basic definition of uh, conventional swing. Um, just moving on quickly, reverse swing would be um, by definition when the ball swings against the direction of the seam. So if the if the seam is pointing this way, um, as shown in the in the diagram, mm -hmm. it would swing in the direction opposite. So this right. ball would swing inwards, right? And it would help if there is if, if the, the inner side is a bit rougher, but it can theoretically be also done with the new ball. 
and mm -hmm. right so we'll go with the other photo right so Right, so this would be a better demonstration of reverse swing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the ball would swing towards um, the non seam side, as it were. Um, so I'll just I'll just take you to the to the difference between the two. Um, mm -hmm. So conventional swing, and that this is where a tiny bit of rudimentary physics might come in. So in just having a bit of trouble with the screen share. Right. So um yeah. here's where the ball the, the air the airflow comes in, right? while right. the ball is traveling. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a part of the air, so the air splits up right about here. And um, on the right side of your screen, it splits up without hitting the seam. It, it's gonna end up hitting about here. Mm -hmm. And on the left side, it's gonna hit, it's gonna hit the seam. So the airflow on this side would become turbulent and turbulence is exactly what you think. It's just like the air particles speeding up a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, so you, on, on the same side, which is on the left of your screen, you, could, you would see like faster air particles, which, and, and on the right side, you'd see slower air particles. So faster air particles, again, this is very, very basic physics. Uh, faster air, air particles generally um, translates to lower air pressure mm -hmm. uh, by by a principle called Bernoulli's Bernoulli's principle, right? Right. And um, so lower pressure on the seam side and higher pressure on the non-seam side. So now that would essentially just be a vacuum cleaner effect, right? So mm -hmm. obviously the force would act towards the lower uh, the, the side with lower pressure and um, the ball will start swinging towards the left, um, towards the side with the lower pressure. Now, pretty much, and that's, that's basically conventional swing in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in contrast, what happens in reverse swing is this. Um, so once again, um, it doesn't even have to be uh, there, like both the sides can be smooth, that's still, that's still possible. Uh, it's just that the, the speed at which the ball would be bowled would have to be like 150 to 155 um, for, for reverse swing to happen, which is a little unnaturally high. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it does help if the, if the non-seam side, side is a little bit rough. And I'll get to why. So what happens on reverse swing in, in reverse swing is that um, if there's a lot of pace on the ball, the roughness on on the right side on the non-seam side um there is there is not i mean it's slightly rough but it's not particularly rough um it's so in in a way that it doesn't just depend on the surface roughness right on the mm -hmm. left side um in contrast what what happens is that there is so much turbulence that that layer of air um that turbulent layer of air is going mm -hmm. to weaken. It's going to start to mm -hmm. weaken, and that would mean that the pressure gradient would. I mean, there's the same amount of turbulence on the right, but a little too much turbulence on the left. So the pressure gradient is going to flip. So that would mean there there would be a higher pressure on um, the smooth side, and a lower pressure on the rough side. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So that that would yeah that would mean the pressure gradient would flip. Um, and that would mean that the that the resultant force would be towards it would be against the side of the seam, um, and that's that's what results in reverse swing. Basically, just too much pace for even the ball to handle. Um, so that's that's the distinction between reverse swing and conventional swing. 
So um, is that why, um, you know, batsmen, um, the bowlers, they try to, you know, add shine and luster to the ball? Is that, is that, uh, is this why they do that? Um, well, yeah, um, j just to keep the shiny, they, they have to pick a side that remains shiny, right? So yeah, that's, right. that's why they do that. But then this is actually why they do, why teams actually indulge in ball tempering, um, because mm -hmm. shining the ball is actually legal right but roughening right. up one side artificially is not legal so um as i said like roughening up the the inside part of that ball would have uh, it it would basically allow you to achieve reverse swing at lower pace, lower paces mm -hmm. right so that makes sense right. um so yeah so th there there would be enough turbulence on that on that side on the on the rougher side and so you could you could achieve um I mean, it would be a more steep pressure gradient. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the pressure gradient thing, it, it might be a little um, difficult to picture. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, there would be a bigger contrast between the two sides, just in terms mm -hmm. of turbulence um, and pressure. So um, yeah, that would mean you, it, it would be technically easier to achieve reverse swing if one of the sides is a little more scuffed up. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, I also read your article about the, the truth about, um, you know, the swing bowling. Uh, it was pretty interesting, especially the part where you spoke about, uh, sorry, where you, where you wrote about the concept of contrast swing. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how was that different from a reverse swing? Right. So um, again, with contrast swing, there are, there are two... Um, there are two possible ways to swing the ball. Um, so this is the kind of swing that would not require a seam at all. Um, it would mm -hmm. just, it would rely on uh, how much roughness you have achieved on one side of the ball. And it, it's purely based on ball maintenance, how well you've kept one side shiny and how well you've allowed the other side to roughen up. Now, the two ways uh, in which it can swing is one at like very normal 110, 15 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. uh, the ball is just going to swing um, towards the rougher side, which is just just very natural. You know, uh, it's it's the same as conventional swing essentially. But um, so I, I call that rookie swing. Um, it mm -hmm. I mean it's it's the kind of swing you you know any dibbly dobbler can just walk in. You know, um, some someone who's a part time medium pacer and just pull seam up and he'll suddenly notice it swinging. Um, but at higher paces, <clears throat> someone like Muhammad Shami has, has achieved um, fast contrast swing um, mm -hmm. quite regularly in the, in the last few years. And that would be the, ball, that would be the reverse swing equivalent of uh, contrast swing. Again, the terminology is a little, little confusing in this case. Mm -hmm. So let's just call it fast contrast swing. So you, okay. it's essentially like the ball swinging towards the, the shiny side and that Conventionally, that's what people call reverse swing, right? Like mm -hmm. it's swing towards the shiny side. Right. And whereas it's it's actually because um, it's it's actually with the seam completely straight up and not angling towards any particular side. So that's an entirely different phenomenon. And um, let me just let me just uh, demonstrate that to you. Um, right. So this is this is I. Yeah, I've just given it a name, counter swing. I don't. It's it's not an entirely technical term, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's it's essentially how how um, you know on on the on one of the sides on the rougher side. Let's let's say the right side is the rougher side, mm -hmm. um, and just a moment. Sorry, the left side is the rougher side, right? Okay. In this picture. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if the left side is the rougher side, uh, you've got extremely turbulent flow on the rougher side. And um, similar, just very similar to reverse swing, it will, there's, there's a very early separation point. It's just going to like the, it's, it, the air will be turbulent, um, but it will leave the surface very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, on the, on the smoother side, which is the right side of your screen, it would be like it would leave a lot later. So that would mean the, the uh, again, the pressure gradient would, would force the ball to swing towards the side with relatively lower pressure, which is the right side. 
So again, yeah, that's how it starts swinging towards the towards the shiny side. So whereas it'll work a lot more conventionally for for uh, contrast swing at lower pace. Right, and uh, does this change um, based on how old the ball is? Like, is it uh, does it swing a lot more? Um, you know, faster or easier when the ball is new, and then it, as as it went, then due to, to wear and tear, it gets more difficult to swing, or is it the other way around? Just in terms of contrast swing. Uh, no, in terms of um, all of, all of this, all you know, the the conventional swing, the reverse swing, and uh, the contrast swing. Right. So, um, yeah, conventional swing is uh, most easily achieved when the ball is new. Um, mm -hmm. because, you know, the seam has not been um, pressed in a lot by bouncing right. and things. And uh, again, yeah, uh, reverse swing is achieved when there's a little bit of roughness on one of the sides because it can mm -hmm. be achieved at a lower pace. Um, contrast swing, it's, it's, yeah, contrast swing, it's definitely going to be visible maybe after like 30, 35 overs um, in mm. a test match. Not not before that. Even on an abrasive surface, not before 35 overs. Um, because, you know, think about it. Even if you take a brand new ball um, and you just bowl it with the seam up, there is no asymmetry between the two sides. It's exactly the same. Mm. The airflow is exactly the same. So it's just going to carry on um, gun barrel straight. Right. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, contrast swing... I mean, it'll take about 35 overs to, to show up, yeah. Right. That's, that's very interesting to, um, you know, to know the differences. Um, uh, you also addressed some of, uh, some myths about uh, swing. Um, can you tell us, you know, some of the myths and uh, if, you know, if, like, you know, there was, a, uh, there was a point about, you know, the, the color of the ball being darker and that kind of, uh, I think it's, it's a, the darker the ball, the more it um, it's you know it, it swings. Uh, is that really true? And uh, also, there's something to do with the overcast conditions, and that also influences the swing. And there were a couple more others, um, other myths that you tried to address. So, can you tell us something about that? Right, sure. So, um, okay, the one about the darker ball is just something James Anderson. He just, right now he sits at the top of the table in terms of the probably the, wicket um, the, the highest wicket taking fast okay. bowler of all time mm -hmm. um i mean it, it really uh, it's really about feel for a lot of these guys isn't it it's it's um they've probably picked out uh balls for the best part of the last 20 years they've mm -hmm. probably picked out the test ball for their team and they've probably noticed that yeah i mean uh the, the darker ones obviously they're the, the dye has been a little more, they've used a lot more, uh, not dye, sorry, just varnish in terms of, um, you know, how, how polished the ball is. But mm -hmm. then, um, yeah, I mean, it, technically it should not um, affect the ball a lot. Yeah, I mean, um, the amount of varnish that, that they put on the ball, it should not affect, it shouldn't, shouldn't have a very, um, Significant shouldn't have a major thing. effect. Yeah, it shouldn't have mm -hmm. a major effect. Um, but yeah, and I mean, in terms of the color of the ball, that that is definitely a myth. That's one hundred percent a myth. It's, um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot said about how this, how the pink ball, for instance, swings a lot more under lights and in over overcast conditions. Um, I think it's it's something we we've, we've basically mistaken the cause for the effect um i mean it's not because of the lights it's it's the, uh, it's a few other things that might happen because the lights have come into play right because mm -hmm. um you know in the in the evenings for instance um i mean however even if there are lights it's difficult for a batsman to sight the ball it's right. it's, it's it's the it's you're playing test cricket in the dark you've never played test cricket in the dark before in the last 143 years of test cricket mm -hmm. so obviously obviously it's going to be a little harder to harder to side the ball <clears throat> so which is what and plus um there are some parts of the world where there's a little more moisture uh, on the pitches particularly in australia if there's a little more moisture on on a hard pitch like those in australia 
I mean, you've, you've got to understand that harder pitches respond differently to moisture than softer pitches, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, um, okay, let, we can get into pitches a little bit here because yeah. um, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit important. So mm-hmm. um, the clay that's used in South Africa and Australia has about 70, uh, sorry, the, the pitches used in Australia and South Africa, they have about 70% clay. That's a lot of clay for a cricket pitch. That's what makes it so, so much harder Whereas uh, pitches in India, we, uh, we tend to make it more out of um, natural materials, just black soil, red soil, that kind of thing. So it does mm. eventually break down over the course of the five days. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the thing. That's why uh, there's, like, there's a bit more moisture. And um, on softer surfaces, moisture just means the pitch is going to get a little tacky. It might get a little soggy. Right. Whereas on harder mm-hmm. surfaces, moisture means you're literally putting water on a tennis court and right. the ball is just going to skid on. It's going to get a little more dangerous for the batsman. It's almost going to pick up pace, but that's just the illusion. It's just not going to lose as much pace. Right. Um, mm. So so that's that's the thing um, in uh, Australia and South Africa in particular. So, um, yeah, it's it's mainly just about the seam movement and um Possibly the ball, yeah, seeming a lot more under light, uh, which which has nothing. I mean, it, it has nothing to do in correlation to the lights. It's it's a lot more to do with how how the pit how the conditions change um, when like around nightfall, right? And mm-hmm. um, similarly to do with the overcast conditions, I think um, that's that's one of the oldest myths in the game that. Um, you know, if the if the if there's a lot of moisture in the air, mm-hmm. then the air is a lot heavier, and therefore there's a lot more resistance for the ball, and that's why the ball will swing a lot more. Now that is a little counterintuitive because just a bit of googling will help you out there. Um, water vapor actually has a lower density than dry air, mm-hmm. so dry air would. I mean, even though it's it's orders of magnitude um, less significant in terms of a ball going through the air, dry air in theory would be better for for the ball to swing than than moist air, um, which completely debunks the theory that um, that moist moist air or cloud cover has any role to play. I mean, there, there have been certain theories about um, convection currents as well, but once again, just order of, or the order of magnitude, I mean, it has, it's likely to have negligible effect on how much the ball swings. So mm-hmm. I think swing bowling is certainly, um, I mean, it has the least effect on, like the conditions have the least effect on swing bowling. I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, um, anything uh, anything else that you want to add on swing bowling because we're moving on to you know the seam, seam um, okay. yeah um, so if you can dig yeah so okay so in terms of external conditions um, I mean there are a few things moisture for instance does help but only in a way that you know there if, if the outfield is a lot more lush and less abrasive the ball will maintain its shine for much longer and therefore swing for much longer. So mm. it's, it's just a, it's just a matter of illusion. Plus, um, there, the, I mean, these these conditions matter a lot more. For instance, um, New Zealand still use the kookaburra, uses the kookaburra ball, but the ball um, tends to swing a lot more there. And um, we'll probably put it down to like uh, cross breezes that they have they have open up uh, open stadiums right so mm-hmm. there's a breeze right. blowing across the uh, there's a breeze blowing across the pitch um, so even if there's very minimal swing available so that cross mm-hmm. breeze definitely does help whatever momentum the ball has gained towards one side so that yeah that that mm-hmm. helps with swing as well so there are some external conditions but yeah light and cloud cover are certainly not um, not okay. those conditions those um, characteristics that help swing bowling. Right, right. Um, so yeah, moving on to uh, seam. Um, so if yeah. you could help us decode uh, the influence of the ball seam um, on the game, and if you could also touch upon the scramble seam that you've written about in, your, uh, in, the, in one of the articles. Right. 
Um, right. So as, as you as you saw, the theme has a lot more to do with um, even swing than than most people. I I think one of the most um, one of the popular theories going around is that you know the ball swings towards the the rough side because mm -hmm. there's more res more resistance on the rough side resistance. and mm -hmm. and less resistance on the on the shiny side there, therefore the ball will eventually move towards the rough side but that does that does not explain how the new ball swings and that's the period it swings the most the new ball swings more than um any other condition of the ball right so mm -hmm. um yeah the seam has a massive effect on that but just in terms of um in terms of seam bowling, uh, I think I think one of the most it's one of the most um, dangerous arts in cricket, uh, probably because um, it literally like a batsman can't prepare for it except just um, you know test his own reaction time. I mean it, mm -hmm. it's almost it's almost a lottery at some point, and it's close to decodable. But yeah, I have done my best to. Mm -hmm. um, just just to demonstrate how um the how how a ball would seem right so um just give me a moment <clears throat> right so i'm just going to share the the article mm -hmm. um on, on the screen just a moment. all right so this was my article for crick buzz <clears throat> Right, so this is the scramble seam. Now I've just tried to break it down a little bit, mm -hmm. and essentially this is like the cross that you see on the ball. It's the mm -hmm. two, the two extremes of how the ball, a, a scramble seam ball, could land. And this is this just like encompasses the kind of uncertainty mm -hmm. um, that that particular variation brings because. The batsman or the bowler has no idea of knowing which way it's going to land. Mm -hmm. But um, technically, if it lands in, as you can see, the five o'clock position, which is with the seam um, slanting downwards from the top left of your screen to the bottom right of your screen, right. um, that would make the ball, just intuitively, that would make the ball um, seem away from the batsman. But again, the batsman doesn't know it, it's landed that way, and the batsman doesn't know that how much it's going to move, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just that it's it's a very diabolical art. It, it, for all you know, it could it could also land, you know, on a twelve o'clock, six o'clock position, and it just won't move at all. So um, yeah, eventually, like if the if the seam is really hard, and um, like while the seam is hard for the first 10, 15, 20 overs. Um, the best a batsman can do is just, you know, play inside the line and let the ball beat him, um, and just hope it doesn't hope it doesn't take the edge. And yeah, that's just an encapsulation of why it's it's one of the most, um, you know, diabolical arts in the game. And uh, are like if you can name some of the bowlers who use this, you know, this technique of um, bowling. Seem right. Um, so in the current fold, there are um, Stuart Broad. He's mm -hmm. he's definitely the, definitely the highest wicket taking seam bowler out there right now. Um, mm -hmm. He's recently crossed the five hundred mark, if I'm not wrong. And um, there's Mohammad Shami, who does it extremely well, particularly in subcontinental conditions. Um, in terms of the scramble seam ball, I think Kagiso Rabada, Rabada is, a, is a really good um, proponent of uh, the scramble seam ball. And oh, it's, it's got him like countless wickets, even though, even with the white ball, which is ridiculous because um, the white ball is literally, it's so commercially designed for the batsman. And yet he's, he's figured out ways to, um, to uh, dismiss batsmen with the scramble seam ball uh, in white ball cricket. Um, and yeah, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, is this um, is this particular technique uh, used only in fast bowling, or can it be applied to uh, you know uh, a spin bowling too? Okay. Um, right. So spin bowlers. 
uh, well, they, they don't, they won't use scramble seam as much, but they do use the seam as well. Um, mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. So uh, particularly someone like a, a left arm spinner, like uh, Ravindra Jadeja or Akshay Patel mm. or Jack Leach, um, they generally have just one variation. They, they don't have one that goes back into the right hander. Um, that's generally just called the arm ball, which, which is just a seam up ball with the seam pointing towards your leg slip, the right hand is left slip, leg slip. So that just means it might swing a little bit just because the seam is uh, pointed, pointed that way. Um, but then, um, yeah, th that's the thing. The ball does things when it lands on the seam and it could just like, it can just predict very, un uh, sorry, um, behave very, very unpredictably. And it could just, you know, land in the seam and um, jag back in and beat the defense of the batsman. So, yeah, spin bowlers do use the seam as well, just to create a bit of uncertainty. All right. Um, and to what extent, um, looking at the seam, like you know, from a from a bat's uh, from a batter's point of view, um, to what extent uh, looking at uh, the seam on the ball. Uh, would help them in predicting or you know make a decision as to which direction to swing um, the bat. Which which direction the ball will swing? Uh, yeah, kind of like to make a prediction and to decide how to face it, kind of a thing. I know right. all this happens in uh, you know a couple of milliseconds, like four hundred to five hundred milliseconds. Um, so you know, to what extent uh, the position of the scene. Uh, before the re release of the ball, um, you know, to what extent does that help the bats, uh, the batter, to um, to understand the prediction, basically? Right. Um, so right. So with the new ball, it's it's fairly simple, right? I mean, they just have to figure out which way the seam is pointed and which way. Yeah. I mean, they can spot the seam. Once again, you know, the seam is designed that way. Um, the color of the seam is meant to be that right. way so that the batsman can spot the seam, right? So on a red ball, you must have seen it's it's a there's it's a white, white seam. On the white ball, there's green or black seams, right? Again, mm -hmm. on the pink ball as well. So this is a, a pink Duke ball mm, okay. with a yeah. black seam. So it's, it's pretty visible if the bowler's coming in like this, right? Right. And um, that's a red Duke ball as well, which has mm. a white seam. Right. So um, yeah, for conventional swing, it's, it's relatively simple um, in terms of spotting the seam, but yeah, I mean, bowlers, bowlers have different techniques. Anderson, for instance, he tends to run in with like he t tends to cover the ball while running in um, just mm. so that the batsman can't spot it. Um, and he has a fairly neutral action as well. You know, out, like primarily outswing bowlers tend to have a more um, open chested action like Sean Tate maybe. And mm -hmm. uh, there are exceptions to the rule as well. Like Dale Stane had a fairly front on action, but he was primarily an outswing bowler. But um, mm -hmm. Anderson probably has the best balance. You probably can't pick it until the last moment. What, what exactly what he's going to bowl? So yeah, mm -hmm. as, as you but as you were asking, these are just exceptions. But uh, as you were asking, yeah, um, spotting the seam definitely does help in terms of seam bowl. Uh, sorry, swing bowling. Um, you know, again, if it's if it's pointed at you, the ball will probably start swinging into you as a right hander. And if it if the seam is pointed away from you, it will swing away. So you can. You can react accordingly. Um, you can even play inside the line if you, you have a very defensive mindset and you're trying to save a test match or something. Um, there are some problems uh, when you're just relying on spotting the seam because there is a certain um, stage of the match when the ball is changing, like when the ball is going to start reversing, right? So um, mm -hmm. at that point, it could swing conventionally or or start reverse swinging you don't know which way it's going to swing so you've got to be a little alert between let's say i mean it's hard to tell it it really depends on how well they've maintained the ball but it, i mean ballpark maybe 28 to 32 33 overs in a in a test match um that's when it might start reversing and 
<clears throat> yeah, I mean, similarly, there's there's a particular variation of the seam ball as well that Ben Stokes bowls, and that's just uh, it's basically a stationary scramble seam ball. I mean, instead mm. of in, instead of the ball oscillating between like this way and this way, he mm. just comes comes in and bowls it this way, right? And then you know it's going to seam away, but you still don't know how much, right? But you can still mm. prepare yourself. You can still prepare yourself right. that, yeah, it's it's going to go away. So I can like play inside the line or shape up for a certain shot on the offside, for example. Mm. Um, so yeah, there are, there are certain cues that the seam position can give you, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so before we move on to, um, you know, just talking about the pitch, I thought we could talk a bit about the most commonly asked questions um, you know, it's it's to do with what we just discussed. Um, it's basically that uh, why does a ball not swing for longer periods, um, you know, during a limited overs match like a T20, but then um, the swing is present for a long, for longer periods during a test match, um, like, you know, when you play a test match, but not, not during limited overs match. So why is that? Right. So, um, so limited overs ball is designed exactly for that i mean it's it's a kookaburra ball as i said kookaburra okay. has a has a, a monopoly in the in the white ball industry at least so um as i said there's only one stitching uh, what there's only one stitch that goes through uh, that goes through the two halves of the leather in a kookaburra ball so it's already like not very durable um the second thing is that the, the seam is very flat in a in a white kookaburra ball. So it just takes a couple of taps. Maybe it, it'll swing for maybe um, two or three overs. Uh, not, not even two or three overs, I, I might be exaggerating. But yeah, two or three overs is, is likely. And, um, and then, yeah, it'll just stop swinging because there's just not, you haven't given the bowler enough. Um, it's just not protruded enough. I mean, the seam needs to have a certain height. It needs to be, um, it's it's just designed for that. It's commercially designed mm -hmm. so that the the batsman can get more runs. I mean, it's the same reason why they've started using um, two new balls in a in ODIs so that the ball can't start reverse swinging after the thirty fourth over. Mm -hmm. um, and also possibly because the ball does discolor a little bit um, after the thirty fourth, thirty fifth over, and it's mm -hmm. not very easily visible visible to the batsman. So. Right. Um, yeah, which is why, whereas the, yeah, the um, the red ball does have, it, it's a much better quality seam. And uh, also just the general pace of a test match. You know, there, there's there's very few uh, batsmen like Virendra Sevag or David Warner who are just going to hit hit the ball out of out of shape in, in test matches, right? Um, that can also happen, that they can also hit, hit the ball so much that uh, it, it stops swinging. But that's, that happens a lot mm. more in, in ODI cricket than in uh, test match cricket. Mm. Yeah. And um, also, I think, I think we briefly touched upon this, right? That the ball swings uh, well in overcast conditions. I think we addressed that. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, we could probably move on to the behavior of the pitch. Um, right. Yeah, if you could tell us um, about you know the different types of pitches, like uh, what's the difference between a pitch that's made with dry grass and then with fresh grass, um, and what pitch is favorable for a one day, then for T Twenty and and uh, you know test match conditions, um, maybe you know in two or three um, you know uh, countries, like you know, I can compare the pitch in India then with with England or um, in Australia. Um, also, if you could touch upon the role of soil, because I, I read somewhere that a red soil kind of helps you, helps it to bounce more. Um, I'm guessing this is because of uh, the moisture that you, was, that you were talking about. So yeah, if you could um, you know, give us some details about these. Right. Um, so the, the, the soil that um, forms the base for any, any cricket pitch is called bully. Um, Mm -hmm. It can contain anywhere from forty to seventy percent clay. Seventy percent clay is quite a quite a high amount, um, and that that would mean it's um, it's 
it, that would make for quite a hard pitch, like um, Australians and South Africans like. Um, so that's that's how the bounce varies. But then the the top part of the pitch um, that could either be red soil or um, black cotton soil, right? So mm -hmm. the black cotton soil, for for example, is uh, is a lot more absorbent. So um, it absorbs water very quickly, very easily, yeah. and um, therefore it does um, bounce a lot more of those surfaces. Um, but it it also it also breaks down a lot more easily um, the the black soil surfaces, and that's that's a bit of a you could call it a problem. But then if it's if it's prepared well with the right amount of water, um, they they do that a lot in India. That's 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 the general test cricket in India. It's made out of black soil. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, those pitches, they will start breaking down at the right time, maybe on day four and five, and then they'll start spinning. Um, mm. And yeah, so that, that's what black soil pitches are made out of. Um, and then there are red soil pitches. In India, there are different kinds of red soil pitches. Uh, there's the kind that can um, grow grass, and there's the, there's the type that can't grow grass. Grow. Ah, grow grass. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, for instance, the pitches in Bangalore, the Chinnaswamy Stadium, and uh, the Wankhede pitch, they have, they're probably the closest to non subcontinental pitches, um, the closest mm -hmm. to that that you can get in India. And um, those are the kind of pitches where the ball will bounce quite a bit. Um, there's quite a bit of moisture. Um, Particularly uh, with the Wankere, which is which is right by the beach, yeah. um, so there is a bit of moisture there, and yeah, there there is like the ball. Once again, the ball loses a, a little less pace than normal, um, which creates the illusion that it's coming on faster, right? So um, yeah, that's the kind of pitch, and and then similarly on. Um, it's the same thing on whereas um, pitches outside of the subcontinent like Australia and England, sorry, Australia and South Africa in particular, um, they tend to rely on just bully, just like uh, that's that's where the term drop in pitch comes from. They don't use a lot of natural material. Yeah, right, right. They, they don't use a lot of natural material. They just um, play with the same pitch, um, allow a bit of um, grass to grow. And uh, eventually, by day five, it just flattens out. That's what you know. Uh, let's say Melbourne has been the MCG pitch has been like for the past three or four years. So um, yeah, these are. It's a bit of a summary of of how the pitches behave. And yeah, I mean, again, for T twenties and um, ODIs, again, as you said, um, the um, dry grass surfaces, right? That's what. That's generally what they prefer. Like it's just pitches that hold together for a little while initially, um, mm. and don't break down ahead of time. Whereas right. uh, that's for T20s, and then for 50 over matches, they'll try to uh, put a little bit of live grass, a bit of green grass uh, initially, so that it lasts the whole hundred overs, and you know mm. just flatten, flattens out in the last. Um, 80 overs really it just it probably won't do anything for the last 80 overs so mm. yeah that's that's pretty much uh, the blueprint for making pitches for let's say, at least modern commercial cricket mm. and um, you know when you're playing test test cricket uh, yeah. do they uh, is it like uh, do they set the pitch and leave it for the first like the, the five days or do they come back and um, adjust the pitch or make changes to the pitch? I'm sorry about that. Yeah, um, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about um, do they make any kind of adjustments to the nature of the pitch uh, during the course of the play, especially during a five day test match? Or uh, do they just settle before um, you know the test match starts and then it's, it's, it's untouched and uh, you know they don't touch it until you know day five? Uh, no, it's not untouched. Um, you th so the batting team gets a say in. Um, so there are rollers, okay. There are light and heavy rollers that mm -hmm. 
they use in the middle of innings and right. yeah the batting the batting team gets a say in um, just in terms of if if they think the pitch has gone a little too soft then they um they'll try to use a, a heavy roller um mm-hmm. just to just to flatten it out and make the bounce as true as possible and um again if if they see a lot of uh, cracks or divots developing in the pitch then again they'll they'll use um possibly a light roller this time uh, just to mm-hmm. just so that the divots are pushed back in and yes that kind of thing again if if there's a lot of if there's way too much moisture on the pitch they'll probably use a light roller because uh, they don't want the pitch to be hard and wet at the same time then it's right. just going to be bad for their batsmen so yeah they do they do make some adjustments because yeah if you just leave the pitch to you know um, natural conditions for 5 days it's going to be a little dangerous for the batsmen i suppose right so yeah and uh, in in continuation um you know how how was that how was a weather, how does a weather influence uh, the pitch like you know there's 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 always a dew factor and you know sometimes the dry weather conditions so how does um, you know that affect the nature of the pitch and how does that affect batting or bowling right um, so well the dew factor is is uh, it mainly comes into play in it it might come into play in day on, day night test matches at some point mm-hmm. but we we probably don't have a big enough sample size for that yet right. um but in um normal uh, odi matches in t20s it does come into play because spinners particularly finger spinners uh, like ashwin jadeja ashwin. um they tend to um you know struggle to grip the ball um particularly because um as i said the the kookaburra the white kookaburra has a has a acrylic coating around mm-hmm. the ball so so it's a lot harder for them to grip even even on the seam it's a lot harder for them to grip the ball because it's literally plastic on the outside mm-hmm. so it just it just keeps slipping away from them it's it's really hard to grip and um yeah so dew definitely plays a factor um and in terms of uh, in terms of other just natural conditions yeah i mean um if it's if it's a really dry wicket and the sun is beating down on it the whole day then yeah i mean it it will eventually become it it will start gripping a lot more and it will become um uh, a pitch where the ball is going to turn a lot more than it did the day before so yeah i mean uh, eventually that's that's why test matches are a lot more interesting um right because you know conditions eventually just magnify themselves and um you see an entire you see how how much things have changed um you can see the you can see it reflect on the scorecard how much things have changed over the over the last 5 days right yeah. um and i'm sure you must have guessed that this question is kind of a harbinger the most commonly asked question in the last two or three weeks um um especially with with the ongoing um india versus england cricket match um we, you know it's a known fact that uh, the hosts always have the home advantage so we kind of uh, we cater the pitch to um, you know to serve as an advantage to to the hosts um so why is that that this test match has attracted a lot of uh, controversies or why is that this particular bit pitch behavior has been spoken about like why is there so much ruckus about this um you talking about the last test match just the pink ball yeah the the pink ball one yeah okay um look if a five day game uh finishes within like not even two days i mean it literally mm-hmm. took five sessions to pick up 30 wickets and mm-hmm. um yeah the numbers are definitely going to draw some eyes um but once again it's i don't i don't fully support um this entire this entire thing it's it it was a pitch where um england batted fairly well in, on day one they they got to about 74 for two and okay, if they, they if they yeah and eventually if they did um end up with even 200 you can see how much of a difference that would have made in in the match right Mm-hmm. so um but yeah that that doesn't mean i i'm supporting this pitch i mean it it was it it did feel like they um you know put all their efforts into making the biggest the highest capacity stadium in the world and then just forgot about the pitch a little bit 
because um, even even when England was bowling, um, their fast bowlers had a problem with the landing area where they should have put a lot more. Um, you know, it's, the landing area needs to be a little more tacky and needs to grip well enough so that the fast bowlers don't uh, sustain injuries, particularly fast bowlers as, I mean, they're, uh, at least England's fast bowlers are in their higher 30s right now. And, mm-hmm. you know, one slip up right now could mean the end of their careers. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, in those terms, in terms of landing area pl- and, and in terms of the pitch, I mean, um, on, on a day one track, the ball cannot be exploding and there can't be pops of dust out of the middle of the pitch, maybe out of the, the maybe like a few stumps outside the off stump or something, but not out of the middle of the pitch. So uh, yeah, I definitely don't support that. I can't, I can't um, agree with the fact that I, I can't agree with the whole hypothesis that, you know, none of the batsmen uh, played spin well enough because these two sides have some of the best batsmen in the world. They have right. um, Joe, Joe Root and Virat Kohli and uh, Pujara, who I think possibly might be an even better player of spin than the two of mm. these guys. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly something to be thought about. I mean, you, you can't just stack all the odds in your favor and it, it literally ends up in a, in a lottery. But yeah, that being said, England did win the toss and it, it's not that they didn't have a fair chance. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, the pitch definitely needs to look in at at uh, Ahmedabad. Oh, that's interesting because, um, like, I keep reading uh, uh, articles again. This could also be because uh, the the people who s- spoken in favor of this were all spinners, and I thought um, I think they thought this is a good time to talk about um, spinning. That you know, spinners are having a good time, so that could also be another reason that they wanted to support, but. Uh, yeah, I'm getting to see two sides of the coin, but it's very difficult to, I mean, at least as a spectator with, with limited knowledge about all this, it's kind of difficult to see, um, you know, if, I mean, you know, w- w- what is right and what is not. So right. it's interesting. Um, I mean, even, even pitches where uh, they put, I mean, there are very grassy pitches as well, right? In Australia and New Zealand. And we've had test matches finish within like, three days there even mm-hmm. two days at, at times so right I mean, um but yeah those are those are again they're, they're better conditions for seam bowling once again but then again yeah you can't make a, a pitch so green that you can't tell the outfield apart um so yeah i mean it, it does work both ways it there has to be and that's the thing that's a it's a part of the beauty of cricket that there's no um set conditions that we have to play in every time right they right. like australia has a certain set of conditions england uh, new zealand india have a certain set of conditions that are very specific and unique to them um and they can keep it like there's so many variables in in cricket as well but again yeah just you know uh, manipulating them um to favor a certain result yeah, that's definitely not favorable. I'm not saying that's what India did here. As I said, mm-hmm. England had a, had their chance. They had a very like a more than fair chance, and the fact that they played one spinner that that tells you a story that you know they didn't um, pick the the right team. Yeah, exactly that too. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but but yeah, you certainly can't. It's certainly not fair to um, prepare a pitch completely uh, with the odds stacked against the home team. That's that's a bit of bias if you may so, okay yeah. all right now let's move on to the last segment um i thought we could talk a little bit about uh the technology now that we've started using drs um in the last couple of years um um you know there's a lot spoken about drs and the hawkeye and you know the ultra edge and all this that we use uh but typically um you know we've seen this during lbws where um uh, why is it uh, a, a not out is actually given even when the Hawkeye uh, camera shows the ball hitting the stumps sometimes um, it says uh, they always side with the umpire's call um, so if it if it was given out it is actually out if they cannot make out uh, the the pro- the projection I guess uh, so what is an umpire's call and why do we have to do it like if the same ball has been balled two times uh, say, in, in the same over, 
it is out um, in one of the you know one of the deliveries and it's not out even though the delivery is the same that's you know the ball is hit the wicket but it's out in one of in one condition and it's not out of the other condition so what is that why is that um so the big unsaid elephant in the room here is that i think they want to keep the the on field umpires relevant um mm-hmm. and yeah just that you know it's there there would be no point in having on field umpires if the third umpire would make make all the calls mm-hmm. um that being said i'm i'm not saying that i support that it's it's yeah it it does there is a problem uh with the system if the same ball can be out or not out um like you know but uh depending on whether the umpire has given that out or not out we we literally saw i think it was in the second test match where ishan sharma took a wicket and mm-hmm. eventually it just looked like if he hadn't appealed hard enough the umpire might not have given that out um and he appealed for a couple of seconds more and he he raised the finger and then on on um hokai we saw uh sorry on ball tracking we saw that it was just clipping the stumps and it was umpire's call so if he if he had uh, appealed a little bit less and it had been given not out it would still stay not out um so yeah i mean my opinion on that is yeah i mean if 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 you want to trust technology just trust it either completely or not at all it doesn't make mm-hmm. sense to go halfway and the second thing is that i think drs was um it, it was made to um just get rid of howlers like complete umpiring howlers like you know there's there's a massive edge or it's it's a yorker but the umpire thinks it's hit the bat and not the foot and it's hitting like the base of middle stump but it's still been given not out so it's mm-hmm. i think it, it was it was initially started to prevent howlers like that and not not um you know balls that are just you know whisking um leg stump or something so um yeah i'm a little bit conflicted about that actually but um yeah eventually i i'd probably go with the side that says that yeah either trust it completely or don't trust it at all mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's it's kind of a is it because of um i i i read about this somewhere that uh, you know um uh, the hokai or whatever technology that we use um it it only goes until uh the ball hits the the wicket and after that or the ball hit pitches on the ground and after that it's just projection and it's just prediction which is why it's difficult to um you know to to confirm whether it is actually out or not right so um well it's it's true that the the parts of the ball can only be traced until it hits it it meets another barrier which is basically let's say the uh, the the batsman's pad so it can be projected mm-hmm. until it can be uh, tracked until then and after that it's just projection so it's projection, like yeah whatever the project so it it has figured out the projectile from the pitch until it reaches the batsman's pad mm-hmm. right and then um yeah from there again i don't know what the accuracy of that um uh, of that projection is so yeah that that might be another reason um yeah that's a pretty good point yeah that might be another reason why um it's not trusted completely but then again i mean i i don't think half cooked um technology should be should be used in cricket anyway um but again yeah if it's if it's just for howlers then it makes sense um and i think i i think uh, one of the better decisions they've made in um modern times is um if it's an umpire's call then the team gets to retain that review they they don't lose right. the review i think mm-hmm. i think that's that's quite an important call um so yeah certainly i mean but yeah i i certainly hope um that the the projection um becomes the projection becomes a little more accurate and in a way that we we are we can um support umpire's call you know we can 100% go with the umpire's call and not um not be 50-50 about it mm-hmm. yeah all right so that's that's all the questions that we have but before uh we wrap this up um 
what else can we expect uh, from your blogs and from your write up what is that what is something new that you're working on um for the, i mean i've been working on uh, a piece on bat making uh, for the last few months because uh, that's in fact an industry that's that has been impacted a little bit uh, by the pandemic yeah. because yeah there were there were no t20 leagues um mm-hmm. there was nothing there, there was not a lot of not even great cricket going on so bat makers um yeah they were a bit they had been stagnated a little bit as well by the pand- pandemic and then um yeah i got in touch with uh, one of the bat manufacturers at grainicles in uh, robert's bridge uk mm-hmm. and um yeah he spoke to me about how how long the whole process is and how how different it is from let's say manufacturing a tennis racket which is it's still a natural material but it's an alloy so it can be um you can make replicas uh whereas in in cricket uh you're basically growing a tree for 20 years before right. you can fell it down and make make bat, bats out of it so it's a completely natural product it's it's handcrafted uh, according to a player's profile and mm-hmm. um yeah it's, it's it's extremely interesting there are different um trees that you know are subject to problems like you know storm damage and think they're literally grown externally right so mm-hmm. i mean just because of weather conditions an entire forest full of trees that could have been cricket bats might just be blown away completely right. and then um yeah i mean that I mean I I got to learn quite a bit and um, yeah that's under under development right now it should be out on Cricbuzz in uh, possibly a few weeks once maybe All right. yeah we definitely look forward to it probably with uh we could also have another session on the anatomy of a bat like how we did oh, for a ball yeah. today yeah, yeah so um great so this is uh this has been great uh thank you for talking to us about um you know in depth about the different uh kinds of balls the the the, the science behind it definitely enjoyed um the th- the aerodynamics the bernoulli's principle it's it's been a while um you know we've gotten a bit rusty with those principles but it did right. come back um it did come back to us um pretty sure it of uh um you know it might at least sound uh, familiar when people listen to it uh so thanks thank you once again for um coming on board and talking to us about this um and i'm going to put up uh, rishi's and uh, you know blogs and uh, you know the links to his um his column on quick bus in the description and also his twitter handle if you have any doubts you can reach out to him and write to him directly um and as always we have really interesting uh, content coming up um in 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 the weeks in the following weeks so uh please like share and subscribe um our to our channel and then um be curious and topic is rocket science thank you very much